Hello, my friend, Dr. Cat. Welcome to Tudor History in 10. Hello. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here today. So we have a topic for today. Time is against us. But first of all, just quickly, who are you and what are you going to be talking about today? So my name is Dr. Kat. I am a literary, material and cultural historian. And today I am talking about the four humours in history. Four humours. Now, people might be thinking that's got something to do with comedy if they're not aware <laughs> <laughs> what humours are. So I think it's a good place to start would be to just describe for us what are humours. So the practice of the study of the four humours is a classical technique that travels all the way through the medieval and early modern understanding of the science of our bodies. There are four humours that make us up, they believe. We're almost like a jar that contains these things. We've got blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. Mm. This is in a world before we understand germ theory. It's in a world before we understand the circulatory system. So we're made up of these four things and health requires those four humours to be in balance and illness or dis-ease uh, requires those things to be out of balance. And that's why people get bled with leeches or fleems or something like that, or they get given emetics or purgatives or whatever to try and rebalance that humoral makeup. So physicians obviously dealt with humours all the time and the general population would have been completely aware and it would have been completely normal for a physician to turn up to assess you and then to talk to you about what was going on with your humours? Yes, and they're going to do that in a few ways. So they are going, they believe that your humours are affected by a variety of things. The time of the year, um, your age, your sex, your hair colour, your skin tone, what you eat, how much activity you do, what your moods are, all of those sorts of things. In the medieval period, you're famously going to see a physician be recognised because they're going to have a little glass jar in their hand, and that's to collect your wee-wee. And they're going to look on it, look it on a colour chart to see where possibly your humoral makeup is out of balance. And they may also taste it to try and figure out what is lacking and they're going to prescribe things which may be like I said bleeding etc but it might also be you can no longer eat red meat it's not good for you until I say otherwise you must only eat fish because too much red meat is is increasing your humor of this and it's making you too sanguine or too choleric so you've got to dial that back so can you give us any examples of some of your favourite types of imbalance of humours? Maybe it's to do with sex, you know, the difference between men and women or, you know, because I think I think there's some really fascinating stuff in this. I'd love to hear what's your favourites. Yeah. So I often give the example of the way in which they believe that women are created. And the belief was that women are made because they are improperly heated in their mother's wombs. And that's why men are hot and dry, humorally, and women are cold and wet. And the humours relate to, so whether you're, you've got too much blood or whatever else, that makes you your heat and your dryness factors, shall we say. And because of that, women are, in essence, inverted men. And there's a great representation of this. It's by a, it's in a physician's book. The man is called George Bartish. It's how I'm pronouncing it, from 1575, I want to say. And he draws the female anatomy. And if you looked at it, you'd be like, that's a penis and testicles. That is the only thing that can be. Until you look at it more closely and you realise that in what is the testicles, you can see there's a, a, a section of it and there's a little fetus in there, a creepy little fetus. And that is when you realise that this is how they viewed the internal workings of a woman. And then there's another story that's told by a few physicians, including one of the most famous physicians of the time, Ambrose Paré. And he talks about this girl called Marie, who's chasing a pig across a field. And the pig leaps a ditch and a fence, and Marie also does the same. And in this fit of heating endeavours, Marie's penis and testicles drop down. She has heated her body sufficiently that she's overridden her femininity and thus become male. 
Apparently, she is rebaptized as Germain, <laughs> grows a lustrous red beard, fights in the army, and fathers many sons. It's, so that is how humours can work in this time, which I think is utterly fascinating. Sounds like something out of Blackadder. Now, I'm hoping that the global audience will have seen Blackadder with Rowan Atkinson, but it sounds like Baldrick reincarnated there. <laughs> yeah, it is fascinating. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is hilarious. Can I quickly ask you, I want to go on and talk in a moment about kind of whether the Tudors saw, use these humours out with the physical body, but very quickly, was there any basis in what they were saying in modern medicine or was, is it, was it really just sort of magical thinking almost and a reflection of the kind of where the, where the consciousness was at the time? I think that probably the closest we get to having um, a link to modern medicine is with the notion of miasma and the notion that there is a certain, there's evil air that can permeate the pores of the body, that, that somehow the, the body is leaky in and out and that it can get in and make you sick. And I'm of the opinion that if we didn't have the idea of miasma, we wouldn't then have the idea to go and look for germ theory. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. The notion there's something in the air, yep. and granted they've got it completely wrong, it's not about bad smells yeah. or evil eyes or whatever else, but I think that that logic sends us in a direction that ends up with germ theory. Okay, right, lovely, great, thank you for that. So yes, I wanted to touch on, uh, we talked about the physical body and the use of the humours in the physical body. Did the Tudors use those humours and interpret them in different ways to do with society, politics, culture, etc.? Well, I, I believe that the way in which the Tudors viewed their own physical bodies helps us to understand the way they viewed their body politic, their nation state. I think that we have a greater understanding of the way they viewed things like heresy and treason as something to be literally purged from the state when you consider the notion of the humours. If every person within that body, and we see it later um, around the Civil War, where we have the image of the body politic, where it's a crowned figure and it's just made up of human bodies facing inwards. Um, in, I'm talking about the Leviathan image mm. there. When you consider that that's what they think, all of a sudden purging vast swathes of the population to cleanse it because of maybe there's plague or drought or just heresy in general, it suddenly makes a lot more sense why they would consider that this would be good for the Commonwealth, which is a notion that is being really born at this time in the Tudor period, this notion of a wealth held in common, that your moral, fiscal and human aspect are all parts of this body politic that can be over or under where it needs to be. And there can be a government response to create health within the body by purging or including. To get balance within the body politic? Yes, I think I think there is a notion of there being balance, but also if there is something that is evil, so heresy, that has to be burnt out and purged like a like a kind of cancer almost mm. from that state. It will it will make the whole state sick. Mm. Now, I've got a feeling that there's a lot of information people might want to go deeper into this topic. Do you have any favourite, maybe you have some more videos yourself or any other kind of reading sources or places people could go to find out more? I mean, there are some amazing articles on um, medical history, uh, which unfortunately most of them are not open access. So you have to go into a reference library, go onto JSTOR, and if you just search the four humours or humoral theory, you are going to have tens of thousands of articles coming up. But it's everywhere. It's in the plays of Shakespeare. It's in all of these medical textbooks. It's part of the, the world of the Tudor people and, and indeed the medieval people. It's going to be in, there's lots of medical books from the time and also recipe books. Cooking oh, to the humours yeah. is also there as well. Yeah. But I have got a video on my channel on the history of the four humours and you can find that on reading the past on youtube and i have i have that video on there well that's good because actually we are coming towards the end of our chat time is running out we've just got about 40 seconds left so this is a great time for you to talk about your youtube channel and any other places that people can connect with you yep so you can check me out on reading the past on youtube i'm on tiktok uh, as Katrina underscore Marchant. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, so you can come and find me there.
Now you do you do videos, don't you? Every Friday on your channel, they go out regular as clockwork. Oh, yes, apart from when I gave birth and over Christmas, they are at four p.m. <laughs> on a Friday. Well, I suppose we could forgive you that. <laughs> Listen, we've got three seconds to go, so it's perfect timing. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Kat. Thank you. Thank you.